series off with a title, Fellowship with God. Fellowship with God. It is so important. The only way that we can keep walking in the light and in truth, in the truth and in love is when we have fellowship with God. It is so important for us to have that relationship with him. Without him, we aren't able. Without him, I am lost. Without him, I am nothing. So I thank God for who I am in him. Now, as we open this first page of 1 John, we notice that this letter doesn't start off like most of the other letters. In most of the other letters, the epistles, we see that they always open with a greeting. I greet you all in the name of the Lord, or I've I've prayed for you in the name of the Lord, or I welcome you, or I send someone in the name of the Lord. There's always a greeting, and there's, most of the time they will say, it's from me, and I greet you from my brothers who are with me, and we send a blessing. They mention the name, they mention who's with him, and possibly they'll give you a hint as to why they have written this letter. I wrote to you, Theophilus because of this. I write to you because of that. I thank the Lord for you because of your generosity. A lot of those epistles and letters start with that. We open the book of 1 John and it starts with that which was. I mean, I don't know if you went to English lessons, but I don't think my teacher would have been happy if I started one of my essays with that which was. What a... After, I can never say that word. There we go. (laughs) What an abrupt way to start a letter. That which was. Now the three Johns were written to encourage encourage believers to keep walking in the light, in the truth, and in love. 1 John, as the opening letter, was sent to a group of believers who were in the midst of an unsettling situation. They were going through some problems, some trials within the congregation. There were some who were, you could almost call them leaders in the community, and they had abandoned their faith in Jesus, living immoral lives, living their lives with a complete lack of practical love. Yet they still said, I am a child of God. They still said, they still claimed to know God and belong to God. You see, their ego took over who they were and what they were called to do. They felt that they were the important one, that people had to come and hear me. You have to come and hear what I have to say instead of what God has to say. Those who were living for God were completely shaken by what was happening. They were completely shaken by what these people were saying and were doing. And this made them quite uncertain about what they believe and what they stand for. This made them quite uncertain what they had been taught. Is this really the truth? Or what they're saying now, is that what we should be believing? John, who had a close ministry with this congregation, with this fellowship, and who was an eyewitness of Jesus came to hear of what was happening and he wrote this letter to them testifying of the reality of the Messiah's coming in the flesh reassuring the believers that they have full access to the truth there there was a lot of difficulty if I read some of the commentaries about the body of Christ they were disturbed that God sent his son and that 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 was the body of Christ and they were quite confused by this and so that is why John emphasizes this he also emphasizes in this letter that godly living and practical caring are signs of those who genuinely know God I was asked yesterday by uh, my friend uh, Pastor Michael If you had to preach on a theme, because he knows I don't like thematic preaching, I like to work through a a book, but he asked me, what theme would you preach? And I don't know why he asked me that. Well, I came to find out afterwards. But he said, what theme is really on your heart? And I said to him, if I really have to look back at my messages, there's almost this little 
thing that pops up in all of the messages. And that is this. If I say that I have God in my heart, it needs to be seen. It needs to be seen by the way I love people, I care for people. So if I say I'm a child of God, as we sang this morning, it needs to be visible. It can't just be a verbal thing. It can't just be something that I believe to be true, but it has to be something that is seen. And I said, that is what really ministers to my heart, is seeing the transformation in people's life. Then when they believe in something, they're actually living it. And this is what John is saying in this passage. He's emphasizing that if I say I am a child of God, if I say I am a follower of God, then I will walk in the truth. Then I will walk in the light. And then I will walk in love. Walking in the light comes from God. Walking in the truth is God's word. But when we are walking in love, it means that we are taking those two things and making it a practical reality. We're starting off this series with looking at the first four verses of John chapter 1. And our focus this morning is going to be on the importance of fellowshipping with God. 1 John 1 verse 1 to 4 says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us this morning. The word of life has appeared and has been proclaimed by John and his associates so that we may have this authentic fellowship with God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. Now I want to ask you a question. If you think back on some of your most memorable moments, don't they all include people? If I look at some of my own joyful moments, they all include people. Not just any people, but people that I love and care for. I think about my first love. And I couldn't wait to introduce her to my family and to celebrate the fact that I have found the one. And next month it will, next month it will be 20 years and she still loves me. Yeah? Yeah. 20 years. I think about when, back at school days, when our orchestra played at the I Stedford and as we won that competition, how my friends and I celebrated together. All the practices, early morning, late afternoons, weekends practice, even we went to a camp to a place in the middle of nowhere, and we spent practicing our instruments and perfecting uh, our, our talents and our gifts. I think about going to the Soccer World Cup, and I know nothing about soccer. But I think about the time I spent with my friends, celebrating. I can't even remember who played. I think it was Brazil because I bought a yellow t-shirt. I know nothing about soccer or any sport, really. But just spending that time with my, fa with my friends and family, the celebration of friendship was what was important. I think of my 30th birthday. And I looked at some pictures recently. It was a themed birthday. And I was very much into Superman. And so everybody was asked to wear something with a, a hero, a, a, a theme. And everybody wore a t-shirt or a pair of socks or a belt or something. And of course, my friends... They took it to the next level. Michael and his wife came completely dressed. He was in a Superman, Spider-Man, um, leotard suit, tight-fitting in January, a hot day. His wife came as Catwoman. She had the ears, she had the tail, she had the boots, she had the works. And they rocked up there. Everybody's just wearing a T-shirt. 
I remember those days. That was the last bride that I had with my dad. I saw the picture still in the back garden. Celebrating friendship, celebrating family. I think about my wedding day. I think about the day Sadie came home. I think about the day that I graduated. I think about some sad moments where my family gathered together to mourn loved ones and lost, lost loved ones we lost and how my church family and wider family and friends were all there to support and show love. I think about the seven years that we struggled to start a family and the only thing that kept us going was the fellowship of our friends and the comfort we received from God. You see, all my special moments included people. I'm sure you all can say the same. All our special moments include people. There's so much joy and camaraderie when people fellowship together. Now, John spoke about how you experience complete joy. Complete joy can only be found when we fellowship with each other, but most importantly, when we fellowship with God. And the first point that I want to make this morning is that fellowship with God is made possible. Fellowship with God is made possible. This is the foundation of the chapter. We can almost see it's the foundation of all three of these chapters. That fellowship with God is the foundation of what we need to hold on to. The fellowship with God is what fuels us to continue the road that he has planned for us and purposed for us to run. Now, we can have fellowship with God. In fact, we should desire to have fellowship with Him because it is through our fellowship with God that our joy is made complete. This joy that I speak to is not just the happiness of, of celebrating something or a little victory. It's not just something that we are celebrating now and tomorrow we, we're back to our, our normal rat race. The joy that we find in God is something that keeps us even when we feel that the waves of the ocean are causing us to sink. Even when we feel that we are standing in quicksand and we are slowly but surely sinking deeper and deeper. Even though we can see the mountain in front of us and we know we need to climb that mountain to get to the top. You see, when we have fellowship with God, we can have joy no matter what the outward experience is. Fellowship with God gives us joy that is complete. Fellowship with God is made possible through the appearance of the word of life, the one who has perfect fellowship with God. Now John goes through quite some PT to make sure that we get this truth about what he's saying. We tend to like the phrase, seeing is believing. Don't we always say that when we see there's a special advertised, seeing is believing. I want to see if that's really true. We are often just like Thomas, where we want to see with our own eyes, hear with our own ears, touch with our own hands. And John says this to us, I have seen and have touched the one which was from the beginning. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The message translation puts it this way, from the very first day we were there, taking it all in. We heard it with our own ears, saw it with our own eyes, verified it with our own hands. He wants to make sure that we get it. He wants to make sure that we understand this, that we believe this. So he repeats it again in a different way, highlighting the fact that Jesus is real. Verse 2, he says this, again in the message translation, The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen. And now we're telling you in the most sober prose that what we witnessed was incredibly this. The infinite life of God himself took shape before us. Now for those of you in the back row, he wants to make doubly sure that you heard it. So he says it a third time. 
We saw it in verse 3. We heard it, and now we're telling you so you can experience it along with us. This experience of fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. You see, the only way that I can find complete joy, the only way that I can live my life experiencing this complete joy in my heart is when I fellowship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, I must just say, these believers were starting to doubt the truth of this message because of what those around them were preaching, because what they were saying, because of their own egotistical desires to be important, to be the leader. And so they were causing people around them to be distracted. John is highlighting the fact to us this morning, amidst our distractions, amidst the things that are vying for our attention, that are fighting for our attention and our focus, he wants to say to us this morning, Jesus is real. And the only way that you can have perfect joy, complete joy, is through him. Now, a second part of this fellowship is that we need to share this fellowship. John said in verse 3 that we have shared what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. You see, John didn't keep this message to himself. But because of what he had heard, the uncertainty and the confusion that these men and women were going through, he wanted to make sure that they hear about the fellowship that he has with the Father and that they too can have. I often say that sometimes the most important thing that you can share is your testimony. Let me tell you what I was. Let me tell you how God rescued me. Let me tell you how I can have joy or peace, like Auntie Jenny shared this morning, in the midst of a trying situation. I can have complete joy because I have fellowship with the Father. See, fellowship with the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, is not something that we should keep to ourselves. We should be sharing this with people we come in contact with. It must be constantly on our lips as we tell people about the goodness of God. You see, fellowship is important. Firstly, I need to fellowship with God. But we must follow what John said in this passage. He said, but I'm sharing this with you so that you can fellowship with me. And our fellowship is not just the two of us, it's with God. And when we fellowship with God, our joy is made complete. So secondly, I want to say this. That we can enter into this fellowship. My second point this morning is entering into this fellowship. So John writes and he invites these men and women to enter into fellowship with God. Now how are we supposed to do this? How are we supposed to enter into fellowship with God? My first response would be to take these words to heart. Take these words to heart. The words that you have heard The words that you have heard and experienced, the presence of God that you have felt and experienced yourself, take that to heart. Now remember these men and women were being misled by people who were leaders in the church. People who at first were on the right track, but their ego got the better of them. These people were left confused. I I don't know what to believe anymore. I don't know who to believe anymore. Is it okay to do that? Is it okay for a believer to say that, to be that, to respond like that? I must give you a warning here that we need to be careful what we hear. Remember at Sunday school, we used to sing that song, Oh, be careful little eyes what you see, hands what you touch. Oh, be careful little ears what you hear. Because the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful little ears what you hear. 
we need to evaluate everything that is spoken to us. In fact, I want to encourage you, and this is what we do in our Connect studies. I hope that you, you believe what I say at the pulpit. But I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to open that passage of Scripture again in the week. I want you to dig deeper. I want you to read the whole passage. I want, to see for, I want you to see for yourself and experience for yourself that what I heard on Sunday was the truth. What I received in that devotion that came through this morning is the truth. What I've heard on YouTube, what I heard on the radio this morning, that is the truth. And I'm going to live by that truth. You see, we need to evaluate everything that we hear because even people that we respect can get it wrong. Some do it intentionally. Some might be doing it unintentionally. But we need to evaluate everything that we hear so that we are not confused. So that when we are asked a question, I can say without a doubt, this is what I believe. That is why I want to do this uh, um, fun Christian fundamental course. So that we as believers can say, look, this is what I believe. This is what I stand on. This is the truth that I hold dear, dear to. And I can say it confident, confidently because it comes from God's word. Somebody didn't just mention it to me. I didn't just hear it somewhere on the radio. But this is actually what I believe. And I stand on it. John's purpose was to clarify the message that they had heard originally. To have fellowship with God, you need to believe that he is the only to God. You need to believe the things that, that John speaks of Jesus. You need to believe that he is the word of God, that he is the word of life. You need to believe that he was with the Father from the beginning. You need to believe that he appeared to man and he is one with the Father. You need to believe that he is the one who brings healing. You need to believe that he is the one that he restores, that does miracles. You need to believe that he is the one who died on the cross for our sins and rose victorious from the grave. You see, you have to believe in these fundamentals to be able to say, I am a child of God and I am in fellowship with God. He's not just a name I recognize. He's not just one that I sing to on a Sunday. He's not just one that my mom or dad speaks about often, but he is God. And I have a personal relationship with him. John was basically saying that we had to see him do these things. So that we had seen him do these things. We had heard him speak the word of truth. We have touched him with our own hands. Jesus is real. The work that he accomplished is real. So come and have fellowship with him. Because he is real. That was John's invitation, encouragement to these people who, who had maybe found a bit of a speed bump in their spiritual relationship. And John was saying, this is the one. It's not just something that I heard somebody else say. But I have seen him. I have heard him. I have touched him. He is real. In closing, I want to say that if this truth is to have any impact on your life, you need to respond to these words personally. If the word of God has to have any impact on your life, you need to respond to it. You see, we can't keep on living with the thought or the understanding that my family are believers. I think there's one of those hashtag so what signs on the pearly gates. My family was believers, so what? My dad was a pastor, so what? I did good things, so what? Did you have fellowship with me? 
could you say that you are my son? That you believe in me? Did you live it? Did you speak it? Did you experience it? If I am to say that I am a child of God, I need to live it. I need to believe it. Doesn't matter what anybody else says about me. I am a child of God. If you want to have and experience complete joy, complete restoration, complete fulfillment, then you need to respond to these words personally. You need to believe the word of God. You need to believe in the word of life because he is the only one who can transform your life and bring you into relationship and fellowship with God. Amen. This morning I want to ask you, maybe let's just bow our heads. I want to ask you this morning, while nobody is looking at you or looking around, can you say with confidence that I have fellowship with him? Maybe you've never asked God to enter your heart and life, to transform you and to make you a new creation. I want to say that now is the time. Maybe you have made that decision years ago. But your fellowship with God is not so sweet anymore. It's something that happens once a week. Maybe you are desiring a newness in Him. As every head is bowed, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand and put it down again. And I'm going to pray for, for everyone as, as a whole this morning. But us raising our hand is simply recognizing that I need to make right with God. I need to fellowship with God. It's simply taking ownership of the fact that maybe I haven't been doing or saying or living like I should be. But now I'm committing myself again to new fellowship with him. Is there anyone here who wants to respond? Amen. 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 Father God, you have seen those hands this morning. You have seen our hearts even this morning. It is so amazing that the God that we serve can look into our hearts, our thoughts, and see everything about us. You know why these folks have responded this morning and you know what they desire in you and through you. And I pray, Father God, that you would renew in their hearts and lives a newness, a, a fresh understanding of who you are and what you, what you can offer them when they turn to you. To all of us, Father God, there might be areas in our lives where we are not surrendering everything to you as we should. Lord, won't you just come and, and refresh our hearts this morning? Won't you come and, and minister to our, our needs, our desires, our, our problems, our situations, whatever it may be, Lord, you come and minister to us. You come and touch us. I want to say that God's love is wonderful. God's love is marvelous. God wants to wrap his loving arms around you this morning and remind you who you are in him. You are mine. You are my son. You are my daughter. And I want fellowship with you.
We need to be reminded our Savior's love for us. His unconditional love for us. Won't we receive that? Won't we hold on to that and experience the fullness of God's love to us? And when we do that, we will stand amazed in His presence. We will sing how marvelous, how wonderful is the Savior's love for me. Let us hold on to his promises, his word, his love, his protection. But above all, let us live as those who are his. Let us serve those around us as we love them and as we fellowship with them. So that our fellowship with them, with Christ, may result in complete joy. Amen. Amen. Won't you stand with me as we...